Everybody hear me? Okay? All right. Hi. Welcome to our session. Uh, my name is uh, Ash Palgat. I am Senior Director for Cloud Marketing at uh, Mellanox Technologies. I have with me my colleagues here from Red Hat, uh, Anita Tragler, she's a Product Manager, and uh, Mark Iskra, he's a Group TME from Nuage Networks. And what we are going to be talking today is um, no patches in our blazing fast and smart telco cloud. It's a joint story that we're building with our partners, but it also has uh, a lot of community elements. So we want to discuss that today with you guys. So a little background uh, on what is happening in the industry. As we all know, uh, this is a popular diagram from itc.org. We all know this. Uh, essentially, the SDN and NFE is a biggest disruption that we are seeing in the industry uh, for the telco networks, for the service provider networks, for the cloud data centers. And what it is, is it's based on disaggregation and uh, virtualization. Those are the two key tenets of the SDN and NFE vision. What that gives you is with disaggregation, you're separating your software from the hardware. You're decoupling that. And with the virtualization, you are getting better hardware efficiencies by having hypervisors for server virtualization, but also overlay networks for, um, for using your underlay more efficiently. While that's giving you a benefit of uh, you know, having an open network infrastructure, uh, going from a high capex to a low capex model, as well as uh, not being locked in one vendor and being in an ecosystem-based uh, solution, play, uh, it's also generating a lot of uh, degradation in the performance. So essentially, disaggregation and virtualization is helping us to kind of really build flexible, programmable networks, but it's also uh, impacting the packet performance or network performance. And one of the key components of this uh, you know, open infrastructure is uh, open virtual switch. As you know, it is a component that uh, connects the virtual machines in the, within the hypervisor, and uh, it's doing the virtual switching. And it can do a lot, a lot of layer two and layer two functionalities too, because it has, the, it has ways to kind of uh, manipulate different uh, headers, uh, do different functions for layer two, layer three switching, routing. However, because OBS is in the hypervisor and the data path it takes is really, really uh, slow, you're having a lot of issues with OBS performance. And those challenges are awful packet performance. You get less than a million packets per second with an OBS in the kernel with two to four cores. You get uh, a lot of CPU consumption when you're trying to run OBS in the kernel. And the, what happens is even with 12 cores, you can only get through uh, you know, 20 to 30 gigabits per second on a large packet throughput. And it is inferior user experience because you're drop, dropping the packets. The latencies are unpredictable. So essentially, this is not scalable. This is not really a good, efficient network design. right? But still, people love OBS because OBS is an uh, open source community. It's programmable. People like it. So what, how do we solve this challenge? We want to have the flexibility, programmability, right, agility, but at the same time, we don't want to lose the performance. And that's where we wanna, our talk today is centered around really accelerating the performance of your software. So on the left-hand side, you have a disaggregated, virtualized uh, infrastructure that's really driven through your traditional CPU-based packet processing. If you move this to a really great acceleration engine with a nicely built, tightly e ecosystem integrated components, you can get a really high performance and high effic highly efficient uh, network infrastructure. So network adapter cards play a very big role in this transformation, by the way. They're getting smarter and smarter. As we know, it's not just speeds and feeds, but also about the acceleration technologies and offloads that you can do in the smart NICs or the, or the intelligent NICs, as we call them. Um, OBS, as we know, traditionally is a word IO based data plane, which means that it's really slow and it doesn't really scale. Uh, what happens with the hardware acceleration is you offload all of the OBS flows into a NIC e-switch, and then you use the SRIOE as a data plane for faster performance. And that can get you really amazing results in terms of what packet performance you can, you can get. Uh, the good news is it's not just a pure SRIOE kind of solution. It has tie-ups into the traditional SDN control plane that is through OBS. So essentially, you're getting best of both worlds with the OBS offload technology that is uh, driven in the community and uses OBS SDN control plane. The packet flow-wise, you can see here that you know, initially, uh, when you don't have the eSwitch, eSwitch doesn't have the uh, flow programmed within, the, within, the, it's within its database, you will go all the way to the vSwitch D, which is the user space component, to get the flow rules. The flow rules will then, for the, after the first miss, will get programmed all the way into the eSwitch, and then the, all the future packets will be fast-forwarded, fast-switched 
in the silicon of the NIC through the e-switch. So that's really giving you the high performance with SRIOV and the e-switch. Uh, one of the questions that comes up is, what is the performance when you compare to the OVSD PDK? So we did our own benchmarking on this. And what we have found is that with OVS DPDK, you're still consuming the CPU cores because it's DPDK. And with the OVS offload here, you're not running DPDK, you're offloading all the rules to the e-switch using SRIOV. That gives you an order of magnitude better performance. On an OVS DPDK, you can get 7.6 million packets per second with four cores. With ASAP squared, or the OVS offload technology, as we call it, the name of Melanox technology for that is ASAP squared. Uh, you get 66 million packets per second. That's 10 times more than what you can get with an OBS DPDK. And you get zero cores utilized. That means, really, this is highly efficient. 100% CapEx freeing of the CPU cores, and 10x the performance. And you can also hit the line rate uh, performance for the large packets. What you can see is this is not a one vendor solution. It's enabled in the open ecosystem with all the open source communities. We worked with OVS, Linux, OpenStack communities. We're going to talk about that in a second. And you can get really good uh, tight integration with ecosystem partners such as Red Hat and New York today. And this is why it's a game changing technology that I think you all should be taking a notice of. We have a demo today that will really be interesting to see. And I think we're ready for the trials here. Right? So I wanna, with that, I want to hand it off to Anita to talk about the community work we're doing. Thank you. Um, so this is just going to go over a quick uh, review of where we are with data paths for a vSwitch, an open vSwitch data path. And this is all 64-byte performance. And we are at the left end of the spectrum where we get low range with OVS kernel. With no tuning, default deployment with OpenStack, we're saying not beyond 50K packets per second. You go to the mid-range if you want OVS DPDK, which is about 4 million packets per second per socket. We're saying so per socket this will improve and go per core, but right now per socket because of NUMA awareness not being ready as yet, there's a blueprint up for NUMA aware we switch that you can check out expected for rocky time frame. And now we're talking about the high range uh, where we have OVS offload as an option and you have TC flower uh, with SRIOV as an option. Here we're expecting close to line rate and we could require minimal um, tuning and NUMA awareness. And you, you still need to dedicate one core, but this is for host services. And, but your packet pro processing, when it is offloaded, doesn't reuse any of the CPUs. And now diving into more details on what um, Ash just presented on from the Mellanox side, this is showing you how it will work with OpenStack integrated. On the right, you have OpenStack controller and an SDN controller where the flows are being sent to OBS, all in the user space, uh, OBS DB server and vSwitch D. Process it and if, uh, send it down to the kernel, the OBS bridge. And if uh, you have uh, hardware offload with TC Flower enabled, and TC Flower is a flow-based class, uh, flow-based uh, traffic classifier. So if TC Flower-based uh, offload is enabled, it allows you to offload flows built specifically for OBS to the NIC e-switch. And the setup with the NIC e-switch is now you have two types of uh, interfaces. You have an SRIOV VF that we do today, connected straight to the VM, but in addition, you have a VF representer, which is the SRIOV PF that's getting assigned also to your OBS bridge. Um, and with this, you have support for the best of both worlds. You have the high performance flows being offloaded straight via SRIOV to the NIC, and you also have the fall back to OVS for any of your signaling, control traffic that can still use the kernel networking. Um, today, with, with the OVS offload, we have support for tunneling, basic tunneling, VXLAN and VLAN, um, as well as support for stateless firewalls. That implies you have match actions for um, input port, five tuple matching, as well as um, that's IP source destination port and TCP flags. Uh, and ARP, ARP matching as well. And we have actions for drop, forward, or you have um, NCAP, DCAP for VXLAN, VLAN, and um, um, TCP, uh, QoS, TOS, and DSCP. Future, we're looking for bonding support, offload, IPv6 um, neighbor discovery, uh, NCAPs for GRE, Geneve, MPLS, and stateful firewalls with con 
contract, connection tracking. Uh, looking at TC Flower, uh, this is how it works with TC Flower going in depth. And here you can see that um, vSwitch D, when it gets a feature request, uh, will offload the, uh, will get a, when it gets a flow request, it will offload the flow uh, to, or send the flow to TC data path if hardware offload is enabled. And it will send it, all the match tables and the actions are sent down to the NIC for further matching. And um, if there is, the, the, by default, the TC data path takes both software and hardware. Um, switching, it can do both. And if the NIC rejects the flow because it doesn't support either the action or it's already full to capacity with flows, hardware offloaded flows, then it can send it back to the TC data path to do switching in the kernel. Uh, looking at a missed flow, if your flow does not exist and there's not a match in the tables in the e-switch, then it will go back up uh, to the TC data path. And the TC data path will, if it has an entry, it will forward it. If it doesn't have an entry, it will be, it's like a new flow, a uh, first packet flow. And at that point, it will send it to OVS kernel and it will do an up call all the way to vSwitch D. And vSwitch D will then, knowing it's a hardware offloaded option, will offload it to the TC data path and down to the NIC. And now the packet when it comes back to the NIC, will follow the match tables, it will me a match, and it will send it to, to the VM if that's the requirement. Maybe deep cap the packet, send it to the VM, forward it to the VM, and then back down, end cap the packet, put some QoS, ship it out. Um, looking at a flow hit, you skip the part where you need to go to the kernel at all. All of this work now just happens directly in the e-switch, goes to the VM, decap the packet, go to the VM, processing in the VM, come down, end cap, QoS matching, or TTL fill, field setting, and then out. And so all the work that was done with OVS today is now we're going to be done in the e-switch. Um, and you have the benefit of a high performance throughput flow using SRIOV, but still having all the, all the v-switch capabilities. And then going back to all the communities that we did work with, uh, Linux kernel, of course, and this is for TC Flower support, as well as um, um, Open vSwitch, and uh, support for OVS 2. in 2.8 for TC Flower offload and OpenStack. We'll not go into all of the details, but you can check the links out, the man pages, the blueprints, as well as the commands that you can use uh, for getting this feature to work with triple O, OpenStack, OVS, and Linux. Now let's look how this all works in Box. I'm going to hand it over to Mark from Nuaj. OK, thanks, Anita. Uh, so uh, we did want to do a test to see how things would work strictly out of the box uh, as much as possible. Uh, so let me just introduce the architecture of the, the test configuration we used. And then I'll show you a demo and then uh, some, some results summarizing the overall um, experience we've had up to this point. So uh, this is a block diagram of the Nuage uh, Virtualized Services Platform. This is an SDN solution. It's a very typical architecture. At the top, you have uh, the management and control, well, the management uh, uh, infrastructure and the automation part. Uh, and then that interfaces with OpenStack, for instance. And then uh, down to uh, a software-defined networking controller, which has uh, been developed uh, at Nuage through the years. And then um, the controller actually programs OVS down on the compute nodes. So at the lowest level, we've taken a modified version of the controller, um, which supports TC Flower as an interface, and use that um, as a mechanism to do the OVS offloading. So we're, we're using an experimental version of our what we call VRS at, at the uh, compute level. And just to understand how this all ties into OpenStack, uh, for today, I will not be actually using OpenStack as a controller. I'll just use some scripts that automate things. Uh, but you know, we're very much in the process of doing that. And with the Queen's release of OpenStack, um, there will be a new uh, mechanism driver, uh, which will enable the uh, switch dev mode inside of the NIC. Uh, and that, along with other plugins that both Nuage and the, ups, uh, the open source community have developed, uh, will have a complete uh, integrated environment where all of this can play together automatically. So uh, here's my demo configuration. I essentially have three different compute nodes. Uh, the one on the left is running um, our SDN controller and our management software. 
the two nodes on the right are actually running compute nodes with our experimental uh, TC driver interface to the NIC. And then uh, what we're going to do is uh, use T-Rex and test PMD to generate load of uh, VXLAN tunnel loads between the two different uh, uh, compute nodes and uh, take a look at what their performance is. So with that, I'm going to start up a video uh, using um, a different Windows uh, media player. And you can actually see how this works. So we'll start out by uh, just logging into our uh, web GUI. Here we're looking at the underlay. So you can see the different uh, physical components. There are green lights there, so they're all connected and working together. Two different hypervisors, a controller, and the management node. Now we'll look at the um, virtualized level. So I've defined two different virtual subnets. Uh, actually, all of our traffic is just going to be confined to a single virtual subnet. So we'll have virtual subnets transported with the uh, uh, existing underlay in this, in this uh, demo. Now, on each one of the compute nodes, I'm going to start up the switch dev mode on each one of the NICs. These are ConnectX5 NICs, uh, which support uh, the TC flower offloading. We have to create virtual uh, functions for SRLV. Uh, so all of that stuff takes a couple seconds. You know, we bind that to the uh, OVS bridge as well. And then once that's completed, uh, I'll just show you the uname from both of these uh, Linux operating systems. So you can see it's RHEL 7.5 out of the box. We haven't really added any patches or anything of that nature. There's RHEL 7.5. And... And same thing on, on the other compute nodes. So the left one will be running test PMD, and the right one will be running uh, T-Rex. So T-Rex is a load generator, which will just generate uh, regular packets inside of a virtual machine. Those will be encapsulated, transmitted to test PMD, then bounced back. So test PMD is acting as a, as a VNF. Now I'll launch these VMs that will be running the load generator and also the uh, VNF, and you'll see the nodes get uh, added in here to the um, uh, virtual network uh, architecture. So there was the, the that was the T-Rex uh, virtual machine. And now I'm starting up the test PMD nodes, a uh, node, and you'll see the interface is defined there as well. So now we have virtual networking between these two different systems on different physical hardware. VXLAN tunnels will uh, enable communication between them. Okay, so next I'm connecting to the virtual machine with T-Rex, and uh, I'll start up the uh, T-Rex uh, server. It's also running RHEL 7.5, so we have RHEL 7.5 host and guest. And we're starting up the console for T-Rex, and we'll start up test PMD on the left. We're going to monitor the CPU usage because another one of the important facts about this uh, offloading is that your virtual networking is not consuming any resources from the compute nodes. You know, whatever you can push down to the, the switch on the NIC totally offloads the compute node and frees it up to do useful computing. So what, what you see now is test PMD is starting up and uh, I've given it uh, approximately a fourth of my compute nodes or my my cores on my, uh, my compute uh, host. And so the utilization will be uh, 25%, or you know, we'll have 75% free uh, idle compute capability on the host. This is goodness. So that means all the useful computing is being done by the VNF, which is test PMD in this case. All right, now we're starting up uh, T-Rex. You can see on the left here also, there are uh, statistics being printed out from test PMD, so you can see the packet rate in and out. Okay. So if you're familiar with T-Rex, you'll see the, the usual interface uh, starting up here with the stats. I've started a load that's basically maximum throughput. Uh, so you'll see about 56 million packets per second at 64 bytes. There is some loss here. So we can back off from that a little bit and get to the lossless state, and I'll show you those results in a moment. 
Um, and the important point I want you to see here is there's no change in the CPU utilization. So this system is actually processing 55 million packets in and 55 million packets out, and there's absolutely no change in the terms of the CPU usage because all the networking work, the tunneling, the end cap, the decap, it's all being handled by the ConnectX5 NIC uh, before uh, the packets actually get passed up to test PMD. It's just highlighting the uh, throughput numbers here, and I'll show you also there's some loss and then the last thing we'll do is uh, I'll actually dump the flows, both from the kernel and also from the NIC. So you can actually see that this was actually being um, end capped and decapped uh, using uh, flows that were actually resident on the NIC. Um, it just takes another second before that comes up. Okay, those are flows from the kernel, OVSDP cuddle dump flows. And then uh, we've also worked out a mechanism to get the flows from um, the ConnectX5 NIC. So with that, uh, l let me just um, summarize some of the results we've seen for different packet sizes. What I showed you there was uh, maximum throughput was 64 byte packets. We had losses. Uh, if we just back off a little bit, we can comfortably do uh, for 65, we can do uh, around 55 million packets per second. Uh, and then, you know, we've done larger packets. And as you can see, the bandwidth tends to go up, but the number of packets per second is to go down uh, just because there's more stuff being pushed around in the system. I'll also just note quickly that um, T-Rex is probably the limiting factor here in performance, particularly for the larger packet sizes. So, you know, I'm running on a Haswell system and we're pushing so much data through the system that it actually becomes uh, an issue even with the PCI bus where we have to tune things to get, get everything working uh, in an optimal way. Plus, we're running inside of a virtual machine, which is a little bit different than the kind of tests we've done in the past. So just to close, um, you know, I wanted to highlight that all of this is being done drawing technology from uh, open source. There are kernel changes that went in around kernel 4.8. Um, there are OVS changes that went into 2.8 and later, and also OpenStack Queens and later will have um, some of the required mechanism drivers to push all this stuff. We have uh, products uh, in, the, in the development and, and commercially released that also support this. So RHEL 7.5 was used with no kernel mods or anything, and all this stuff just worked out of the box. It's early access. ConnectX5 and ConnectX4 are commercially released. And uh, Nuage uh, will probably release something around the 6.0 uh, time frame. So with that, thank you very much. I hope this was interesting. Feel free to drop by our booths later on today if you want to ask questions. And uh, that's it.